<laughs> so when you leave, can we say Cal has left the building? Yeah, something like uh, that. Okay. <laughs> Channeling Elvis. Um, well, Cal, we'll come right to you uh, with the first, uh, first question. Uh, yesterday in your message, you alluded to high taxes in Washington as being uh, Mickey Mouse and Pastor Begg also then referred later to even gun control issues. What guidance would you give preachers on the limits to politics in the pulpit? And when is it to be limited and when is it to be front and central? So from a journalist perspective and then on down to uh, the preachers among us here. Well, I hear a lot about uh, how uh, preachers need to preach more about politics, but you know, I don't take my car to a surgeon for an operation. Uh, most people can figure out where they are and basically this is just reinforcement that they're asking for. Why settle for a lesser kingdom? The only power to change a life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can all know stories about people whose worldview has changed after they've been transformed by the renewing of their minds. And the best person to do that is Jesus of Nazareth, not Limbaugh of West Palm Beach, who I love, who I love and I listen to, or Hannity of New York, or Levin of Leesburg, Virginia, but Jesus of Nazareth. He's the only one who can really transform. So why do we settle for less? David said when he was king, put not your trust in princes and kings and in mortal man who cannot save. That's good enough for me. From one of the preachers, how do you, how do you struggle with this tension? Well, I think that the pur purpose of preaching is to preach the word. On the other hand, I mean, and there are preachers that that's all they do is talk about politics and current events and psy pop psychology, and that's not what we're called to do. However, however, there is a dimension that we get from Scripture where the church is called not to be the state, but is to be involved from time to time in prophetic criticism. We see it in the case of the Old Testament prophets, where they had to profit, uh, they had to criticize the king. In the case of of uh, uh, the Nabez vineyard that was taken by Ahab, and the prophet rebuked him. We see it in the beginning of the New Testament when John the Baptist loses his head because he publicly criticizes the immorality of the king. And there are, though uh, we're not sending automobiles to uh, surgeons, ministers should know something about ethics. And we distinguish between personal ethics and social ethics. And the church does have something to say about social ethics. And there are times when the application of Scripture demands that we say something to our congregations, that our congregations might understand the ethical issues that are involved in uh, certain political environments. I mean, I'm the last guy that's involved in, in the political realm, as you all know, but there are times, I mean, we have to say something about abortion. We have to say, call the state to be the state, that the state's very raison d'etre in the first place is to protect, sustain, and maintain the sanctity of human life. And when the state fails to do that, the state fails to be the state. And I think it's the duty of the church to call the state not to be the church, but to be the state. Because the state, whether they like it or not, is under God and will be accountable to God for its reign. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that kind of preaching is going to convert the state. Uh, probably not. But uh, so at some point, somebody has to call them uh, to accountability. Well, I think I'm the one member of the panel who has taxation without representation. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I can, if I can speak to that, uh, which is incidentally the reason if you, if you invite me to take tea with you, I will decline. <laughs> Since uh, just of this deep-seated native, native suspicion 
that the tea bag came out of the Boston Harbour. <laughs> and um, Americans are very creative people, and I know they've found ways of preserving those tea bags. Um, <laughs> you know, I think a basic principle for ministers of the gospel to understand is we are ministers of the new covenant in Jesus Christ, and the powers that be that have been ordained by God are also ministers of God. The disastrous thing that sometimes happens is when we make the responsibility of the ministers of God in the realm of politics the hermeneutic by which we expound Scripture. There are bound to be times, as R.C. has said, when simply in the course of feeding our people from the Word of God, the Word of God impinges not just on our church life, but on our life in the world. And it's appropriate then, I think, for the Scriptures to be expounded. But, I, you know, as an outsider looking in, one of the striking things about the, the evangelical subculture in the United States has been the transition from a biblical hermeneutic expounding the text of Scripture to the people who are in front of you to a political hermeneutic where you're expounding the text of Scripture to people who aren't in front of you. And I think that always means that the people of God will be undernourished, their political heads will grow, their political opinions will become more strident, and their souls will be famished. And uh, so, I think it's so important we stick to the Scriptures, and that means we are always safe and we use a proper hermeneutic. What is the role of civil disobedience? Is there a role for civil disobedience? You haven't said anything yet. Well, thank you, Cal. <laughs> Well, the only thing that I would add to the previous question, Chris, is that I agree with everything that's been said, so it's not an either or, it's an all and on what has been said. I, I totally agree with what Cal said. The only way, really, that we can change our country ultimately is by preaching the gospel and for hearts to be regenerated. Uh, democracy will not work without regeneration. Um, because a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, if they are an evil people, is a disastrous thing. Uh, and so the people must be made um, to a sense of having a fear of God in order for a democratic society to work. And so the power lies in the preaching of the gospel. I, I do agree with R.C. that there is a time and a place for a prophetic word in which the Word of God is brought to bear upon the issues of the day. And I'm not preaching to Washington when I stand up in my pulpit to preach, but I'm giving a Christian worldview to the people who are sitting in the pew that I address. And I, I brought a series uh, to our church after this recent election. I wanted to frame what just happened, that God is the one who raises up rulers, and God is the one who removes rulers, and we must bow to the sovereignty of God. And this is being played out on a far grander stage than what any of us even realize. And, and so there's a, a degree of respect and honor that we must give to those who are in authority over us. And First Peter 2 talks about honoring the king, and at that time, as Peter wrote, it was a, a monster who was on the throne. And so we need to conduct ourselves with a, with a degree of respect as Christians towards those who are in authority over us, but God has sovereign purposes to raise up certain even evil rulers. Uh, uh, R.C., I've heard you preach on Cyrus and the sovereignty of God over Cyrus and, and God calling him my anointed, this pagan, unregenerate, unbelieving ruler that God raised up to carry out His sovereign purposes to bring against Babylon so that the people of God would be released from Babylon to return to their, to their homeland. I mean, there would have probably been believers picketing against Cyrus and what God was carrying out, but that was God's preordained plan and purpose in human history. So we don't even understand all that God is doing 
And w there comes a point of, of, of yielding to the sovereign purposes of God in history. Um, but I think that we, as preachers, must give a Christian worldview, a lens uh, through which we help our people see what is going on in, in the world around us. Also, I would agree with Spurgeon that there are certain times in the life uh, of a nation that the preacher must address what just happened. It could be a national disaster, and you give the appearance of irrelevance if you do not speak to what is heavy upon the minds of everyone that's in the pew, and that is a golden opportunity for us to step into that situation and be the voice of truth that uh, helps our congregation see this catastrophe, this national event. Um, and at times, it could even be the judgment of God um, upon either the nation or the discipline of God upon His own people and giving us what we actually deserve. Chris, with respect to the question of civil disobedience, I think the principle that the Bible gives us is very simple. The application of it may be excruciatingly difficult and complex, but the principle is this, that we are always to obey any authority that's over us, from our parents to the king to the dog catcher, unless that magistrate or that authority commands us to do something that God forbids or forbids us from doing something God's, God commands. The early church was uh, exceedingly scrupulous on this matter. Justin Martyr's apologia in the second century, an appeal to the Roman emperor Antoninus uh, Pius, uh, pointed to this uh, exceptional level of civil obedience that the Christian community gave, except at those places where the government required the Christian to do something that God did not allow them to do. That's going to be the essence of my message later, so I'll shut up at this point. <laughs> um, yeah? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, I wish Alistair were here. He's usually bolder in responses to these things. There is sl something slightly amusing about that question coming up. What is the role of civil disobedience? This is a nation that was founded in civil disobedience. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Freedom! <clears throat> um, you know, and we, we ask the question often uh, as though this were a huge issue for us. But actually, the huge issue for most of us is civil obedience. The right context for civil disobedience is civil obedience. I'm not suggesting this questioner is coming from this point of view, but often that question is asked from a very different heart perspective from the perspective of civil obedience. That as a Christian, my responsibility and privilege is to yield to the powers that be. And I mean to do that because I want to yield to Jesus Christ. Um, Often this question is raised because I actually hate the kind of government we've got just now. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I do things still, although I've been in this country a long time naively, but the, the Wednesday after the presidential election in 2004, I stood up at the beginning of our prayer meeting and I said, we're going to spend the whole of this evening praying for President-elect Obama and his family. In 2008, yeah, 2008. I was very struck. I don't have the, I don't have the emotions and vibrations of, of an American. I was very struck by people saying to me, that's the most difficult prayer meeting I've ever been at. Um, but we're commanded to pray for those who are in authority over us. And uh, I think we very much need to watch our hearts in these matters. When we look at the people who have really been pressed with persecution, late 20th century, 
that, you know, some of the people we know from Romania in the days of Ceausescu, their message was this, you will not find more loyal citizens in this country than you will find among the people of God. We will be far more loyal to government, but when it comes to the principle RC enunciated, we have to obey God rather than men. So the disposition begins with, we are faithful and loyal citizens. God has given us great privileges. Otherwise, we end up demeaning the liberties God has given to us, and when we demean them and the offices involved in them, we do end up losing them. And I can't but notice how striking it is that Peter speaks about kings. <laughs> and Samuel Rutherford is very good in this. The Scottish tradition of civil disobedience is worthy of study. That'll be in the bookstore next year. <laughs> Do any of you see so any signs of revival in our nation? Well, let me just say that my uh, Scottish role model is Eric Little, you know, and uh, in, the, in the ultimate moment of, I don't know if it was civil disobedience, he wouldn't run on Sunday because he, had be he believed and practiced that the Sabbath was a day of rest, and you've seen the movie and all of that. So that was a, an interesting thing. So, God save the Queen. Uh, <laughs> what was the question? Was the question? <laughs> yeah, very good. That's very good. Yeah. <coughs> Sides of revival. Well, I was down at the funeral home the other day. I didn't see any. Um, you know. You don't see it as, until it's upon you. I go by these little marquees and small churches and some big ones, you know. Revival meetings scheduled beginning next Monday at 8 o'clock. How do you know? I mean, the Spirit moves as He moves, and the revival is about His church, not the world. You can go and apply mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to a corpse. Your technique may be perfect, but the guy's still going to be dead. So uh, if you go back and read the History of Revivals in America by J. Edwin Orr, a magnificent book. Each of the three or four, if you want to count the one before uh, 1776, the major one was 1857, I think, uh, it, it, they all began in what he called a concert of prayer. Now, we all give lip service to prayer, and we've heard about prayer. And Jesus went away and prayed for extended periods of time and if he needed to pray for extended periods of time, considering who he was and the kind of, you'd have to say, direct link he had with the Father, unique relationship, then why don't we do more of that? You hear somebody who's ill, and you'll hear someone else respond, all I can do is pray, as if it was a last resort and not a first resource. Uh, and yet prayer is the most effective and powerful thing that we can do. So. We have to have the right motives. James talks about, you know, you don't get your prayers answered because you ask amiss. So why do we want revival? Do we want revival so the stock market goes up, so the person we want in office gets in office, so we can feel better about ourselves, or do we want revival to demonstrate the power and glory of God? Now, if we asked with that motive, he might respond. But the revival in 1857 began when two men got together once a week because they were concerned about the condition of the country and decided on their lunch hour on Wall Street to pray for revival. Then they decided the circumstances were so difficult they needed to meet every day on their lunch hour, and some other men uh, started to come along with them. The crowd grew, grew so large that they started meeting in the churches, and then their wives came as well. At the height of the revival, which exploded without TV, without radio, without direct mail, without any of the manipulative techniques that we use in our modern age, 10,000 people a week came to Christ in New York City. Uh, when the revival went to uh, West Virginia in the middle of winter, and uh, it was so cold there that they had to cut holes in the ice to baptize people in the cold water. Some commentator imagined when Baptists uh, do this, you know they're on fire. Um, 
and it, the revival jumped the Atlantic, and it went to what we call the UK, and there was a work slowdown in the mines in Wales. Somebody asked, how could there be a work slowdown with a revival? Said the mi so many miners were converted that they stopped using bad language, and the horses couldn't understand what was being said to them. <laughs> The whole modern missionary movement came out of this. There was a young man in Chicago who wanted to teach a Sunday school and was told by the church that there were too many teachers to go out and find some boys off the streets of Chicago, take them into the woods, discipline them, and then bring them back in, and that'll be your Sunday school class. That was Dwight L. Moody and began uh, one of the great ministries in, in the history of, of the modern world. So you see small things, weak things, widow's might, mustard seed, last plates at the table. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Humble yourself and he will exalt you. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and we do it the other way, and that's why it isn't working. So prayer is the key, the entryway to revival. How can we prepare our children to defend their faith when they go to college? Don't send them to the pagan colleges. What would you expect? You have people who, who are in these places that if the government schools haven't beaten your faith out of you, uh, teaching you that your material and energy shaped by pure chance in a random universe with no author of life, no purpose for living, no destination after you die, a little more complex than a salad but of no greater significance, what would you expect? <laughs> Hello? I think that's an advert for Reformation Bible College, is it? <laughs> you know, um, I, I tell you what people did in the past. Um, they taught their children the Shorter Catechism. And they did that for several reasons. One was because it gave their children a framework of cosmic understanding. It gave them an understanding of where they fitted in the universe. It taught them that if you know the Scriptures, you will be wiser than your teachers. And it also taught them to think. And in particular, and there's been some work done by sociologists in this area, it taught them how to ask the right questions. Uh, if you go home, to, you know, tomorrow afternoon, take a quiet two hours and decide you're going to write a catechism for children or for, you know, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, you will very quickly discover how difficult it is to write a catechism. How do you write a question with an answer that leads to the next question? And one of the… I'm sounding as though I am Eric Liddell, but one of the, one of the impacts of the Shorter Catechism on the tiny and impoverished nation of Scotland was that in the 18th and 19th century, it produced so many outstanding intellectuals of all kinds, philosophers, theologians, engineers, um, who all had been reared in Scripture and the Shorter Catechism. And the theory is that one of the reasons they had this brilliance was because what their parents were actually doing, perhaps not realizing it, they were actually teaching children to think. Now, my observation as I teach in seminary, and so I read the papers of college graduates who can sometimes hardly spell, small numbers know how to use the apostrophe. Does Reformation Bible College teach you to use the apostrophe? That's the ultimate <laughs> test of a proper reformed education. Um, and if you give them a paper to write on a topic on which you have not taught them, or an exam question that you didn't give a lecture on, they get a bit excited. Because the idea that an education teaches you how to take the knowledge you do have 
and apply it to something you've never thought about has absolutely disappeared. Interestingly enough, the same lady who spoke to me after the Obama prayer night uh, said to me once after a sermon, she said, you know, I was in graduate school before any teacher I ever had said to me what you said from the pulpit tonight. I said, what was that? In living the Christian life, you need to go back to first principles and work them through to every situation. And that had been no part of her education. But it's embedded in the kind of teaching that's given in Scripture and catechism. And it really does make our children wiser than their teachers. It's astonishing. There are some… There are some who say they heard the call to preach, teach, pastor. I have not audibly heard such a call, nor do I expect to. But I do have a great desire to teach and to pastor. What are good guidelines to follow in determining a true call to the ministry? I am currently an ordained Baptist deacon. Thank you, R.C. Rocks. <laughs> true call to the ministry. Um, I think Spurgeon's uh, opening chapter in lectures to my students is probably the best treatment that I, I have read on discerning a call to the ministry. Uh, I think it begins with uh, a compulsion. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, if any man aspires to the work of an elder or overseer, it is a good work that he desires to do. Um, those word, those verbs, epithemia, are, are very intense verbs, that there is a passionate, overwhelming compulsion to be involved in God's work by teaching, preaching the Word of God, that there is, I could not do anything else except this. I must do this to proclaim the Word of God. I mean, there is a fire in your bones uh, that you have to do this. I, I remember reading the biography of W.A. Criswell once, uh, the pastor at First Baptist Dallas. As a young man, he would go out. He was born out in West Texas in the middle of nowhere, but there was such a fire in his bones to preach, he, but he had no one to preach. So he'd literally go into to the chicken house and, and preach to the chickens, and, and he just had… Yeah. <laughs> We have sheep in the Baptist church. Um, <laughs> so, it, it really begins with a, with a compulsion, and I know in my own heart that that's where it began. Um, I, I think that there has to be confirmation from others, uh, uh, leaders in the church, um, other people come up and uh, affirm what they see in your life. It's one thing to think that you have the gift to preach. It's something else for for others who hear you to sense that you are gifted by God to preach His Word. Uh, Spurgeon <clears throat> also said that he could not believe that he was truly called by God into the ministry until there were converts under his ministry, and that there would be the fruit of, of his preaching. And then also circumstances. Um, I, I had one brother um, graciously come up after the sessions yesterday and say he senses a call to the ministry, but his wife does not support him in this, and that she is not with him in this. And I, I said, quite frankly, I think circumstantially and providentially, your wife is going to have to be on board with you, or this is… you're going to be driving the car with the emergency brake on. This is not going to go anywhere. And, and circumstantially, God's going to have to work in her heart to be a partner with you in this. She's not going to be the pastor, but she must be uh, the wind in your sail that encourages you as you minister the Word. And so, there's circumstances and God opening doors uh, for training and for to be equipped and opening doors to exercise your giftedness to preach and minister the Word. And I know in my call to the ministry, um, th that was… I, I was as much thrown into it as, as I… Um, stepped into it, and great men in the past. It's remarkable how just the invisible hand of providence has, has put them into this work. So, th there must be a deep, 
down in your soul because to be in the ministry is challenging, it's difficult. Um, you will face opposition. I mean, you'll be crossing a line and no longer being the most popular person in your school. Um, you, you will face the devil head on and the hordes of hell. And so, you're going to have to know deep within your heart that God has appointed you for this, and you're not going to fold up your tent the first time uh, there's a challenge to your ministry that I'm here by divine appointment. God has called me to this. So, you must be inwardly persuaded of this, uh, that there are hills worth dying on. So, to answer that question, Chris, I think it's critically important and, and I do think that there are men in the ministry who were truly never called of God to begin with. Uh, I agree with John MacArthur at times, we need fewer pastors, not more pastors. We just need better preachers, not more preachers. Uh, those who would build with gold, silver, and precious stones, and not wood, hay, and stubble. According to Paul, According to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, he says to stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. What are these traditions to stand firm on? That's one of the most important words in the New Testament, parodosis. It's the word for tradition. It means giving over, giving across. And the term tradition is used in the, in the Scriptures both in a positive way and in a negative way. We see the stark contrast that Jesus uses when He uh, distinguishes between the things of God and the traditions of men. This was His fundamental rebuke of the Pharisees, that they were more interested in, in, con in continuing their own human traditions which they had substituted for the truth of God. In that sense, tradition is the enemy of truth and of the kingdom. And that's why some Christians swallow hard when they'll hear the apostle speaking of tradition in a positive way. But what the apostle is saying is that I'm preaching to you what was given to me. I didn't invent this. This came to me from the Lord and from the apostles, the other apostles, and that there is an apostolic tradition. And that apostolic tradition is a divine tradition that is to be carried on and carried over and passed on by every Christian uh, uh, successive era and every Christian uh, generation. And so, we have to make that distinction between the good and the bad, but we better not confuse the two. It is the, the biblical tradition, the divine tradition that we are committed to and to carry on. We have a question here also then about with so many interpretations of the Scriptures during the early church and in our modern age, how do you know you have the authoritative understanding and interpretation of Scripture? This is the principle of private interpretation. This was one of the key issues of the 16th century. Uh, the church uh, in the fourth session of the Council of Church condemned the Protestant movement for uh, carrying on their own interpretations that were contrary to the interpretations given by Holy Mother Church, to whom it is given of God, according to them, to give the one correct interpretation. And they warned, and as Luther was warned, that if you allow the Scriptures into the hands of, of uh, lay people who are unskilled and untrained, this is what we went into with the perspicuity of Scripture, and he said, a floodgate of iniquity will be open. You'll end up with 2,000 different denominations, and, and, and the body of Christ will be fragmented, and, and the Bible will be turned to a wax nose, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Luther said, the message is so clear the basic fundamental message of the gospel is so clear that everybody has to be able to hear it and read it for themselves. And he said, and if a floodgate of iniquity be opened, quote, so be it, all right? 
And so he's ready to die for that principle of private interpretation. But here's the thing. In that fourth session of Trent, and they can insert, sort of, they condemn anybody who, by private interpretation, distorts the scripture, and then goes on to say, teaching against the way in which the church is taught. Uh, under, that person is under the anathema of God. Well, private interpretation never gives any individual the right to distort sacred scripture. The only right that I have of interpreting it for myself is the right that carries with it the responsibility to interpret it accurately. That's why I always have to test my interpretation with the teaching of the whole of Scripture, the principle that Scripture interprets Scripture, as Steve set forth yesterday, is the Holy Spirit's way. There's an internal coherency and unity of all of sacred Scripture. So I must test my atomistic views of individual verses with an understanding of the teaching of the whole of Scripture. And not only by myself, God has blessed us in the church with teachers. We go and we read the commentators, and, and it's amazing how much of a consensus there is on particular texts and how much we learn from the insights of other people. But I've said this always, that there may be a thousand different interpretation or applications of a given text, but only one correct meaning of a given text. And so when we disagree, over the meaning of a text, we have to be willing to go to the mat and wrestle this through and try to come to an agreement as to what this text actually teaches. That's why we have rules for biblical interpretation, the whole science of hermeneutics, so that people just can't go off on wild goose chases, just making the Scripture teach whatever they want it to teach. But, but it's there. The truth is there. My sin is always in the way of an accurate understanding, but it's not so obscure that God has given us things that are unintelligible. It's still clear. He interpreted, as Luther said, that not all parts of Scripture are equally clear, and those parts that are obscure are to be interpreted by those parts that are clear. It's the opposite of the way we tend to do it today. We find these crazy interpretations of individual texts, and then you try to interpret what is clear in light of these goofy uh, things that you bring to the text, and that's always going to be a problem. But there are rules of interpreting the Bible, just like there are rules for interpreting any written sentence. I wish the Supreme Court members would understand those basic principles of hermeneutics <laughs> in interpreting the Constitution, right? Real quick, because uh, I, I got to run to uh, catch a plane, but real quick, let's take a couple of practical examples out of that for modern application. Uh, the theological left uh, likes to say that Sodom and Gomorrah were not destroyed because of uh, sodomy committed by all those men there, but rather because of uh, inhospitality. You hear this a lot coming out of Eastern, formerly Baptist Seminary in Pennsylvania. We won't name names. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the pro-choicers uh, say that um, Jesus never talked about abortion, so therefore there can't be anything wrong with it. These are clear misinterpretations. Clearly the sanctity of life is from beginning to end. Uh, God created out of nothing, out of, out of the earth, uh, human beings. Uh, Mary had the ultimate crisis pregnancy uh, when she appears before her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord would come to visit me? Not my fetal Lord, not potential Lord, uh, but my Lord existing, in fact pre-existing uh, in fullness uh, standing uh, before her though in the womb of Mary. So these are all uh, misinterpretations of Scripture and many others that are crafted to fit uh, the uh, political objectives of the world. And uh, we're not going to be able to persuade the unbeliever of this because, again, they haven't been transformed by the renewing of their minds, but there are an awful lot of squishy believers in churches who accept this kind of stuff and vote for politicians who believe in this and who quote Scripture out of context, including at prayer breakfasts, 
and uh, want you to believe that uh, somehow they have an insight that other people have not come up with. So the Word of God stands for itself, as Paul says in Timothy, you know, for instruction and reproof, correction, and all these other good things. And I've got to run. Pray for me. Thanks. Bye, Thank Cal. you, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> Mr. Thomas has left the building. <laughs> Now that the seeker-sensitive Cal Thomas has left the room, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, just, a li just a little footnote to that discussion in terms of the history, Chris. You know, one of the things particularly Calvin emphasized was we are, we are being accused of disrupting the traditions of the fathers. The problem is you men do not know the traditions of the fathers. And there's some amazing little cameos, especially of Calvin taking place, uh, taking part in debates um, where the whole issue is what is the teaching of the tradition of the church? Um, where Calvin, just off the top of his head, said, if you had read volume 9, page 302, second column up at the right-hand page, you would realize that what you have just said is a complete fabrication. So, the, ref the reformer's view was not, uh, we are turning our backs on the communion of the church. The reformer's view was, we are actually recovering the core teaching of the communion of the church. And um, Calvin in particular had outstanding knowledge of that tradition. Same thing to say is, especially in the apologetic over against Rome, by which uh, evangelicals are somewhat swamped these days, the answer to the accusation of Rome is to say, do you not read your Roman Catholic commentators? They are all over the map in their interpretation of Scripture, and yet their books of these funny Latin words, nihil obstat and imprimatur. The notion that the Roman Catholic Church as a community of people holds the same interpretation of every text of Scripture is a figment of people's imagination. And it's a figment driven by these documents from the past that say it is so. Because you'll find these very same Roman Catholic commentators saying, essentially, all these traditions of the church that were based on these texts these texts have nothing whatsoever to do with these traditions. I'm not saying that the traditions are wrong. What I'm saying is these traditions have nothing to do with this text of Scripture. So, the idea that in Protestantism every man is his own Bible interpreter, and in Roman Catholicism there is only one interpreter of Scripture is absolute fooey. And R.C. has really underscored for us the safeguard is that we read Scripture in the light of Scripture using scriptural principles to interpret Scripture, and we understand that we do that in the community of the saints, which is why we have teachers and preachers and why we write books and read books and, uh, and, and all the rest of it, and there is, there is that safety and security given to us. And when we see that, we look back on the, the history of the church and we see there's a colossal unity and unanimity in what the gospel is and what the Scripture teaches. And we shouldn't be blindsided by these picky notions that are eating away at our confidence in Scripture and especially in its clarity, because that is an area that is uh, so often under attack today. Last question. Last question. How do I know I am saved? Well, ultimately, it comes from the Holy Spirit, uh, the same Spirit that convicted and called and regenerated is the same Holy Spirit who persuades and convinces the heart that I belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 John talks about that, um, 1 John 5, verse 
13, these things I've written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And John previously has spoken of the inward testimony and the inward witness of God the Holy Spirit to those who are truly born of God, that they belong to God. So there is this inward internal witness. First John also speaks of an external witness that there in First John are eight or nine evidences of the new birth. Uh, this is not a, a, a multiple choice that three out of the nine would be seen in your life, but that across the board there would be a, 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 a dramatic change progressively yet nevertheless decisively in, in a person's life. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And so you go through First John, there is the necessary evidence of the new birth. And as you examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, you will by necessity begin to see the buds of this fruit begin to mature and develop in your life. And if you do not see this evidence in one's life, you should really um, examine yourself more carefully. Um, and, you know, there, there's a new love for the brethren. There is a new desire to obey God's Word from the heart. Uh, there is a, a, a new understanding of Scripture. There is a decreasing love for the world. There is a growing love for righteousness. Uh, you see prayers answered. Uh, all of these, First John, lay out as evidences of the new birth. The gospel of John is written in order to know how to be saved, how to have eternal life. First John is written that you may know that you have eternal life. And of course, there is the confidence in the Word of God that says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And have I truly repented of my sins and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ with an understanding that He died in the place of sinners and the finality of His death to be the perfect atonement for all who put their trust and faith in Him. Um, it, it rests upon the testimony of Scripture and the finality of the death of Christ and the inward persuasion and witness of the Holy Spirit and the necessary evidences of the fruit of a new creature in Christ Jesus. And as these uh, begin to line up, you should have a persuasion that I belong to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I think that that is the foundation of how I can know, uh, have the assurance of salvation. But the last sentence, I do want to underscore that it's an inside work of the Holy Spirit of God in the heart. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really, at the end of the day, matter if the evangelist signed the back of your Bible and you put the date in it. It doesn't really matter what mom and dad had to say. I mean, in your heart of hearts and in your soul of souls, does the Holy Spirit indwell me and does He persuade me that I belong to Christ? I think, I think there are four kinds of people in the world. Jim Kennedy used to say there were three kinds of people in the world, those that can count and those that can't. But there are four kinds of people in the world. There are those who are saved and don't know that they're saved, those who are not saved and know they're not saved, people who are saved and know that they're saved. So far, so good. But the fourth category is what muddies the water, those who aren't saved who know that they are saved. So if I think that I'm saved, how do I know that I'm, I have true assurance and not the false assurance of the unbeliever who's not saved who thinks he's saved? Well, obviously, the first thing we have to do is understand what salvation requires. There are those people who say that everybody's saved, I'm a buddy, therefore I'm saved. So they don't understand what's required for salvation. They, right. They're universalists. They have a false sense of security. Other people have a view of salvation that's by works. They say, uh, you're saved if you do good works. I do good works, therefore I'm saved. 
and you get a false sense of salvation. So what you first have to have a true understanding of what salvation is and how it is obtained. And then you have to ask yourself, have I met those requirements that Steve just talked about? If the, and here's where it's easy to understand justification by faith in the head. To get it in, this, in the bloodstream is very difficult because you'll, every time you sin, you begin to wonder, how could I be justified? How can I be reborn? How can I be a Christian and act like that? In simple terms, when people ask me that, I ask them, do you love Christ perfectly? And they'll say no. Well, so most of the time. I've, I have met some perfectionists who say yes, but, uh, well, do you love them as much as you ought to love them? Well, if they answered no to the first question, they have to answer no to the second question because they ought to love him perfectly. And so they say no, so all of a sudden, any little bit of assurance they were clinging to have already begun to slip through their fingers with those first two questions. Then I get to the third question. Do you love him at all? Do you have any affection? And I'm talking about the biblical Jesus. The biblical Christ, do you have any love or affection for Him at all? And if a person says, well, yeah, it's not what I would like it to be, it's not what I think it ought to be, but yeah, I have some affection for the biblical world. Well, here's the thing, if we understand what happens in our salvation, you know that if you're unregenerate, you not only have no affection for the biblical Christ, but you can't possibly have any affection for the biblical Christ. So if you have any real affection for the biblical Jesus, that is an indication that God the Holy Spirit has changed the disposition of your heart. And if you understand that only the Holy Spirit changes the disposition of the human heart, and He only does that in the case of the elect, and if you're a Calvinist you have every, and you have a sound theology of salvation, then it's easy to come to a clear biblical understanding of the assurance of it. If you're not Reformed in your thinking, if you're Arminian and your flower's not the, uh, not the tulip but the daisy, and you're plucking petals saying, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, <laughs> the, the, road to, the road to assurance is pretty difficult, you know. But that's where your theology can be very important in helping you understand whether you are in fact in the kingdom of God. If I understand that salvation is of the Lord and that I couldn't have any affection for Him unless I were regenerate, and I couldn't be regenerate unless I were elect, it's QED. Thank you, gentlemen.